half the room. Who's in the design business? Who are designers? That's the other half of the room. I know I'm in, now I know I'm in the right place. That's <coughs> uh, very good. Um, I'd like to say hello, first of all, on behalf of my two colleagues and uh, myself to uh, this uh, session this afternoon. Um, uh, can I also say that um, it's intended to be a workshop, so half the time we'll talk to you, but half the time you're going to be doing some, the other half of the time you're going to be doing some work yourself, um, and you're going to then make uh, presentations. So I don't know how many people there are in the room, perhaps there's 30 in the room, um, at some convenient moment when we break, I'll, I'll be asking you to split up into uh, groups so that you can work in groups and make a group uh, uh, presentation. Um, the title of uh, this afternoon's uh, session is Revamping the Brand, um, Power of Visual Identity and of Visual Merchandising. Um, I don't think we say revamping the brand in the sense that the brand is, or any particular brand is uh, losing its power or isn't any good or is on its way down or something. We're not necessarily meaning its regeneration. I think what we mean by that is the power of visual identity and visual merchandise to make the brand really work and work harder. So we'll be looking at two presentations, one from Michelle, who will pre present first, which is really about the brand and the role that the brand plays in the business of uh, retailing. And then the second presentation we shall look at will be from Raphael, who will be taking us through various examples of visual merchandising. And we're asking you to put these two presentations together in your minds so that when we come to ask you to uh, do a workshop, do some work, you'll have in mind these two presentations and the key points that have been made in these presentations and the key points that you yourself have uh, taken from them. Um, I just wanted to uh, start uh, with this particular slide. Um, I constantly hear two things about India. One, that Indian retail will grow and grow and grow exponentially. Uh, I constantly hear that within a decade, the, the, the retail component of Indian uh, GDP will have grown from about 4% to something closer to 18%. I'm constantly told that retail in this country is growing uh, rapidly. And then equally, I'm told, ah, but retailing in India is different. It's different from anywhere else in the world. So one of the things that um, we'll want you to explore in your workshop this afternoon is why is it different and how is it different and why should it be different and what makes the Indian consumer want things different. Um, and uh, it may be that this is the case, and it may be that it's not the case. But the history of retailing, which I'm not going to spend any uh, time uh, really with you on, has generated in what we might call the Western world, and by that I mean those countries where retailing has been brought to an organised format. Um, in most places in those countries, this is the kind of route to market that, uh, uh, that, that you will find. If I could just quickly talk through um, those uh, routes to market. Um, there are what we would call platforms. So we start off with publicly owned platforms. Companies, retail companies which are owned by the public. They have shareholders and they're owned by the public and the public have some control over the operation of that particular retailer. There are owner-owned uh, retail businesses and owner-owned retail businesses which may eventually become publicly owned. We have partnerships, franchises, we have agents and we have dealers. 
Now, all or none of those may exist in India at this uh, present time. If you go to Russia, for example, you will not find many publicly owned retail businesses. Remember that it wasn't very long ago that Russia was a command economy, and therefore there aren't many at this particular moment publicly owned retail businesses. There are a number of growing owner-owned businesses which will eventually become publicly owned, and we have a great number of agents and franchises where other Western uh, retailers wanting to enter, let us say, the Russian or, for that matter, the Brazilian market, have set up franchises and agencies and, and dealerships. And India may be, look, may, the lands, retail landscape in India may look something uh, like that. When we look at channels, um, in the history of retailing, that creates certain kinds of channels some more successful than others, and some that work in different kinds of markets. But we could call a store one channel, a growing channel is online, we could call a catalog a, a, a channel, but increasingly we have multi-channels. We increasingly, in the West, we have successful businesses which are not just stores, but they may have catalogs, they may have, may have online, they have clicks and bricks activities, they have click and collect activities. We have TV Direct uh, channels which are available to us. And again, as I say, in India, there's some seats down at the front here, gentlemen. Um, again, as I say, uh, these may or may not exist in the current landscape of uh, India. But those platforms and those channels have created the middle uh, column which is really <coughs> formats. Um, and one of the formats that you won't see in that particular list is what you call the Karana activity. Um, and we should talk at length about the Karana activity. Um, but what we, you might call the Karana activity, um, we in the West might call the C store activity, i.e., the convenience store. But your Kurana convenience store is very different from the Western co uh, convenience store uh, operation. Um, that is a major difference, one of the major differences between your landscape and what we might call the Western um, uh, retail landscape. But the middle column may give you a picture, a window, if not a picture, a window on the future of retailing in India. Is it likely in India that we will see re the development of re retail parks? Is it um, uh, reasonable to expect the growth of hypermarkets here? We can see that department stores and shopping centres are growing. But we need to take a look at that window and decide whether the landscape here is likely to be fertile for that kind of um, uh, what we call format uh, development. And that's very important. We're only going to look at a tiny part of that uh, today when we look at the sea store activity. But the development of what we might call organised retailing in India is likely to produce a, f uh, 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 a page that looks something like that. That snapshot is what you will find in most developed retail markets. And so the question we might be wanting to ask ourselves when we're into a Q&A session later on, is that likely to be the platform that we are likely to see here in India? Or is it here going to be different? And then we should want to know from you why you think it would be different, or should it be different? Is there another kind of format which is more appropriate to the Indian landscape than we have seen developed over centuries in the rest of the world. Um, that's enough for me by way of introduction. Michel will now talk us through his thank you, Michel, talk us through his presentation which essentially is, to, is about the, the, the importance of the brand in 
uh, that retail landscape in those channels that we've been talking about. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Michel van Toren. I'm, I'm here for the TU Delft, the top tech. Uh, actually, I'm a retail designer at a company called SVT Branding and Design Group. And these are some examples of, uh, of Dutch and, and uh, Western Europe retailers for which we work. Uh, what I saw for me, ADI, it's, 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 I saw a lot of you, you design logos, you design this and that and that. Uh, what we tend to say is that design uh, gives form to the thought. So it started with good thinking, and then we start designing now. Um, first of all, uh, in general, what, what we said is, is retail is not, not so much about shops and stores. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's not about the thing. It's about what it wants to accomplish. It wants to, to make, a, make a big company uh, connect to the customer. And, uh, if you see that in retail, um, in contradiction to, to, to advertising, for instance, uh, advertising is for mass media, and retail is a one-on-one -on -one relationship you have to have with your customer. Because you open up your shop in the morning, and whether you, uh, you have a turnover of 100 million euros a year or, uh, or 1 million, you have to sell it day by day per customer. Uh, so you have to, to make it relevant for, for individual customers time and time again. Uh, as you say, you market to the masses, but you sell to individuals. So you have to make it very, uh, very um, uh, interesting for for us, for people. And and that's the big difference between design, retail design, in the sense, and uh, and advertising. Um, my great example in the, in this life, in retail design life, is Rodney Fish. He always says that uh, that retail. Uh, retail is the purpose of life. Now, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know whether it's, whether it's that, but if you think about it yourself, you think about, at least in modern society, you think of, of buying stuff, uh, you're sad, you want to buy yourself happy again, or you did a good job, and you want to, to give yourself a pet on the shoulder, you go to a shop and you buy stuff. And in that sense, uh, retail um, is, is the vehicle who, uh, of which makes that possible for and, um, and the other thing we say is that, that retail mirrors society. And, and you see that happen now all the time because you're, you're moving very fast here in, in, in India. But we see it in, in, uh, in Holland or in, in England uh, as well, that when society changes, retail changes. And, and sometimes, every now and then, there's a very new retail, uh, uh, retail idea which changes society. Uh, you, you don't have IKEA here, for instance, but IKEA changed the way we furnished our house. So there it started from retail. Most of the time it starts from a change in society. The pressure we have on time brings out a lot of convenience stores, for instance, in, 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 in Western Europe. In, in retail, the brand will truly represent the essence, where you can read it yourself. Um, that means that when you enter a shop, uh, you see everything. Uh, if, you, if you compare uh, uh, a producer, say for instance Mars, candy bars, if they say we want to have the hippest candy bar, it, it, it might be possible. They go to, to an ad agency and, and ask them to, to make a great campaign, they, they develop a new candy bar, they go to a packaging design company and make a very, very slick and nice uh, package. And it stands on its own in shop or in, uh, in, in other places. It stands on its own. With the ad, it might be possible to be the hippest, the hippest candy bar on earth. Uh, when you enter a shop and, um, and they say we're the hippest, you really have to be hip. Because the staff has to be, has to be very trendy, uh, the whole look and feel, everything. You can't, there's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to hide, actually. So maybe if, if, if you try to accomplish that without having it in, in your soul, you can, you, can, you can try it out for a week or two, but then the audience, we, who know and understand all the signs, uh, we are specialists in, in understanding whether it's true or false. We will know uh, whether it's safe or not. I will not go too deep into this into this uh, model, but this is a is a model we will use in the in the whole uh, in our whole program, um, uh, where where you can see the brand is in the middle and the changing world is on the outside. Sometimes it starts with the changing brand. Sometimes it's, it starts with the changing world. Yes, consumers are involved, 
does, does the world change because the consumer changes or, or does the consumer change because the world changes? Well, it's, it's every now and then it changes. Yeah. And then consumer, when we say tribes, but it's moments or situations. Uh, when you think of yourself, sometimes you're a father of daughters, as I am, or you're a mother of children. Sometimes you're a friend of friends. And, and maybe you, and sometimes you visit your parents. You use another language than you use when you talk to your friends. In, in your head, you're still the same, but you're, you're open for, for different, in different situations, for different moments. So, a consumer is not a consumer. He can change, or she can change, within a certain situation, a certain moment of the day, or the week. Or Monday is different from Friday, or from Saturday. So, you, you really should, should think of that. And then, uh, there's the brand, and around it is the whole marketing mix. And this says, it will really, truly represent, in a, physical, in a physical story, it will truly represent the brand. Because if you have everything right, but the staff doesn't understand the concept, you don't have to shop. If you have everything right, but your assortment isn't there, they say, very nice store, it's very nice, sorry you don't have to use assortment, so call me next time. So you see that everything is very holistic in this sense. If you look at branding, um, it's, it's about the ambition of the company in the spirit of time. That's, that's what, it's the identity and the ambition. So it's who you are and what you want to accomplish as a company. And you want to, you want to get that uh, 